you very much for inviting me to talk to you today. And it's absolutely amazing because Emma and Emmy have primed so much of what I'm going to say, um, which I can expand on. Um, so that's always really useful to know that we're all convening on the same sorts of messages. So my section of the presentation is going to be about how to put together your first funding application. I know most of you have limited experience of that. Um, and I'm going to give this presentation on the assumption that you do not have massive amounts of support around you. Now, some of you may have Emmys and you may have Emmas who are key and I'll cover that, but um, there's lots of things you can think about um, by yourselves. And also um, I'm gonna look at the process from planning which funding agency to select, um, understanding what they want and then taking it through to actually writing the nuts and bolts of the application. So why on earth would I have any qualifications to talk to you about this? Um, I've spent the last 20 years offering funding support within academic institutions, very much in the way that Emmy does, and we've actually worked together previously. Um, I'm not an academic, and I think academic perspectives are really important to that. So this, so it's really good that Emma's already given some experiential um, uh, you know, account of of what it's like to actually be out there on the front line, take the rejection, put forward your amazing ideas, and just feel that they're being misunderstood or thrown back at you after you have spent so much time writing an application. And it's really important to have that sort of sympathy on your side as well. Um, but what people what people like Emmy and I do is take academics through from selecting a bid to submitting that grant. Um, and I think we get some understanding of the assumptions you might make as an inexperienced researcher. And we can help streamline the process for you, set you on the right track, make sure you bring in the right help at the right time and do things in the right order as well, as well as writing the bid in the right way. I mean, my background was writing press releases for soap and Liam Perrin's Worcester sauce um, and all sorts of brands and actually it's as I'll go and say that's not a bad background for the actual writing part of the bid it's not that useful for the planning part of it um, but over my years I have um, worked on things like UKRI future leader fellowships ERC starting grants and ESRC new investigator grants so I've got an experience of a wide range of um, uh, different funding schemes. You can find more about me through these links. Um, and uh, I did write a book about 10 years ago on um, how to put together a funding application that Emmy also referred to. This presentation falls into three parts. We'll do two of them before we have a comfort break. And then the actual writing, the proposal, the abstract writing exercise will come after the break. The first um, section is on how to create a fundable research project rather than just an eligible research project or making the submission deadline um, and that's a whole range of things from choosing your funder to uh, considerations of design then we'll look at planning an individual application so you get something coherent and competitive in on time and finally it's writing the proposal if you get the first two steps right then the proposal is going to largely write itself, apart from a few hints and tips. Um, I'm sure any would agree with me on this, but there's nothing more frustrating than being given a proposal to review a week before the deadline and thinking, oh, but that doesn't fit the scheme, or the team's not appropriate, or it's not right for the academic's career stage, or there's a real flaw in the design that should have been picked up earlier because there's nothing we can do at that stage. So we would urge you to start planning as early as possible and bring the right people in to make sure that by the time you actually get to writing, you know what you're doing and that's gonna be much smoother um, and you don't feel you're completely wasting your ideas uh, because often you can't resubmit to a particular funding application, to a funding scheme. Um, in, it's a very different process to the other forms of academic writing and dissemination that you might be used to. Um, I'm sure you know, all of you have got PhDs and most of you will have written for publication and that's probably the nearest model you've got for writing a funding bid. But they're really different. A publication 
disseminates the findings of a research project that's happened already. For a funding bid, that research hasn't happened. It's a proposal. Um, so the publication is disseminating, the funding bid is describing and justifying. You've probably got quite a long list of journals and they're probably ranked of where you can send a paper and you, you know, you hope for a revise and resubmit and then you you work to the next journal. In terms of a funding agency, there might be very few available. And there might be only one that fits your project. It's a much higher stakes game. Um, and also the funding agencies aren't that specialist, unless it's the small learned society that Emmy was referring to earlier. They usually cover a wide range of disciplines, even if they're looking at just the social sciences or just the humanities. So you're always writing for non-specialists. Um, a publication is assessed very much on its own terms. Is it good enough for that journal? A funding bid is assessed in competition and not in a like for like competition usually. Um, you, it, it's a bit of luck of the draw. If there's something amazing in the same competition, you might not stand so much of a chance. So there's this unpredictable aspect of it. And again, you have to make the case that your project is more important than a very different project. Deciding to publish something is quite a low cost decision for the publisher. They, you know, they want your paper to get cited and keep their um, citation rates up. Uh, but for a funding agency, it's minimum thousands of pounds and sometimes millions of pounds. And they have their stakeholders to account for. It's very high cost and it's very high risk. You know, the research has not yet been conducted. So they have to really take things on trust and will need lots and lots of evidence to be convinced that your project is the one they want to invest in. And also you usually can't resubmit with a few exceptions. That's why we all love the European Research Council because it has a very humane resubmission policy. Um, most of them, you, you might get some reviews, but no resubmission. Sometimes with say like the Leverhulme, which is another excellent agency, you just get a no. And you never really have any insight as to why your project didn't get funded. And that can be incredibly frustrating. So if you're writing your first grant application, you're starting from a very different base. So the first part of this publication, this uh, presentation, is how to create a research project that's actually in with a chance of getting funded. So the first question you need to ask is why does an organization want to fund research? Why would it do that rather than um, build a school or um, you know, fund a healthcare program? Why research? Well, you know, as, as Emmy explained, there's lots of different organizations funding research and they have different aims, which might be charitable, might be cultural, might be economic, or might be politically motivated. Um, and it's really important to, to know where they're coming from. Uh, they also all want to generate important knowledge. But they may have their own definition of importance and it might not be quite the same as yours. So that's also really important to know straight off. Um, and as well as just straightforward research projects, there might be a whole range of interests they have, you know, it could be capacity building, uh, methodology, um, looking at a particular health challenge, a particular geographical area, or supporting a particular type of researcher. Again, you need to know that before you start. So there's going to be a lot of groundwork and a lot of research you have to do before you pick your funder and design your project. So the funding agency, the one known they're going to have when you apply to them is you, because your project is an unknown. So they're going to be making an investment in you and any team members you have. And what they will be looking for is evidence for your talent and potential as a researcher, whether you can solve the particular problem you specify, whether you know about the area that you're researching in, whether you have the right technical, methodological skills, um, and whether you're a decent project manager. If someone's gonna give you a million pounds, they really need to know that you're going to complete this project successfully. You're not gonna fall out with everyone. You're not gonna give up halfway through. Uh, you're not gonna run out of money. Um, 
All these things need to come across in your um, application. Um, so we're going to start with um, a little five minute pause um, where it would be great if you could just sit down with a pen and a piece of paper and against these five points, work out what it is that you could be invested in. What would your contribution be to a project? Either led it entirely by yourself as a fellowship or where you might be acting as a co-investigator. Um, so it's now just before 11. So if we could, um, you know, I'll, I'll ring a little bell at five past 11. Um, and if anyone is brave enough to volunteer and say what sorts of things they came up with, um, where their experience is clustering, uh, if they felt they had any gaps, that would be brilliant. And I want anyone out there who came up with answers under all of the headings I put, who would be willing, or, or most of them who would be willing to talk through what they came up with. Emma will have to be our stooge if no one else comes I up with be. it. I have, I have written <laughs> something for myself. I would love to somebody else to speak. Come on, volunteer. I know you want to. Even if brave. you just found it really difficult. Yeah, yeah. Angela, oh. you volunteering? Well, kind of. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I, I, I can... I mean, obviously, I'm not looking at it from a personal perspective. I'm looking at it from a project perspective. Um, so I'm probably different. I'm not, a, as I say, I'm not a, I don't, I'm not, don't come from a research background, but so I don't know whether I'm the best person to speak really, but, um, I can, if you want me to. <laughs> Was there, um, I did see someone, um, Sharman, did you uh, unmute to have a go as well? Are you from a research perspective? Uh, yes, yes. I, uh, try to think about these five points and, and I could not come up with all all the five answers, but uh, some of them uh, did ring a bell uh, through the work that I did. But I will let um, Angela go first, and then I can share mine. Oh no, Charmin, please do, <laughs> please do. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you, Angela. So um, about uh, specialist methods and techniques. So uh, this is about what. I and our team can offer um, to uh, the funding agencies. So I believe um, in terms of methods and techniques, we um, have lots of expertise here and through my work with Leicester Real World Evidence Unit at the Leicester Diabetes Center. So uh, we have a very good track record in analyzing electronic healthcare records and I particularly have built an extensive experience in um, data management, data curation, um, applying machine learning methods, AI algorithms. So I believe uh, my strong point is that um, analyzing and getting insights from data, especially big data, which is we know all of us that it's uh, getting really difficult to handle nowadays with uh, lots and lots of data coming up. And uh, so knowledge of specific health conditions, I believe that one is a little bit of um, difficult for me because I'm not a clinician. My background was different um, to uh, the colleagues that I have been working here with. But I believe uh, with a good team of clinicians and healthcare workers and epidemiologists that we have here, um, it, uh, it won't be an issue because we will all work together to um, solve the question or to uh, tackle the question that we are proposing to a funding agency. And access to particular resources and facilities. I believe that we have uh, a very good and um, streamlined access to lots of different databases that we are, uh, that we analyze, for example, CPRD data, sale data, BHF, uh, national level data. So uh, this is one of the strengths actually that we have uh, within our team. And another strength would be links with uh, non-HEI uh, project partners. So we have a very good active collaborations with Office for National Statistics. And we have done multiple projects with them. And one of the projects I was a co-lead 
So we have access to their uh, data sources, their trusted research environments, and very good collaborations with um, researchers uh, from over there. So I think that is another strong point of our team. And aspects of project management. So uh, this is where I am currently lacking because I have never uh, sort of um, been a principal lead of a project. I've always been a, a co-investigator. So uh, this is something where I'll be uh, looking towards to build a track record of mine through new projects and uh, funding applications. Um, yeah, this is everything I wanted to share. Thank you. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Charmaine. That's exactly the sort of um, you know, response uh, I wanted from that exercise because it shows a how much you've got to offer and you sound amazingly fundable but also where you will need to look to others to build up a team around you because very few projects funded projects are sole investigator nowadays so it's quite normal that you would bring in someone who has the project management experience or someone who um, has the knowledge of the specific health condition you're looking at, if, if that is uh, the issue. So at planning stage, it's really good to look at, you know, what your skills are. Um, Louise also put a comment in the chat about how you evidence project management before you've had a chance to do it. Well, I think actually, if you've already been co-investigator on a couple of decent grants, that would establish you well enough to make that leap to principal investigator. I think it's just if you try to go from, say, PhD to Welcome Discovery Award, there are going to be a few question marks <laughs> around you. Um, and so, as, as Emma said as well, um, just building up your experience with smaller grants is really important. Um, if you've organised a conference, a seminar series, a network, and actually it's quite good to volunteer to do those things. Um, We've got another session in July about building your track record where we'll look at how you might draw on adjacent skills as well. If you've had a previous career, you know, so for instance, if you have also been a teacher, it's sitting on committees, Emma, that's also a really good one. So you know, if you show that you can bring any project to completion, that's gonna help build confidence. Um, so that's really excellent. Angela, did you have something you'd like to add to that? Um, no, I'm mean, to say I'm looking at it for a project perspective rather than personal. So I, I, rather about what what I what our project in terms of planning for the project. But um, you know, Sharmin, I'm very grateful that Sharmin is a fantastic researcher within our team. <laughs> so um, I could um, I verify everything she said. She's brilliant. <laughs> um, I, I, I so I'm, so obviously things like um, our project has has got a lot of experience in healthcare research, project management, and learning. Do, disabilities um, uh, we developed unique um, learning disability data um, health knowledge um, through the analysis that we've done so obviously that's something we, we want to further progress um, our data is currently across CPRD and sale and we've got links with lots of technologists in terms of potentially bringing in other data sources as well for the future um, and we we're, we're lucky that we have very close relationships with with the institutions that we work with, but also Leicester NHS Partnership Trust, um, you know, Leicester County Council, health bodies, charities, uh, and also the local person, people with learning disability community, which has been, you know, a huge asset to our projects. We're, we're very lucky that we've got people in our team who are are linked in through um, speech and language therapist and um, learning disability nurse who are actually in the project who who bring. So we're working very much alongside the community. Um, and you know we're lucky to have great team relations. Um, you know, I think as a project manager, it's very well managed and coordinated. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I came in new to project management. I came from a, from a ref background. I came from research office, but from coordinating a ref submission. Um, so I guess there are skills which I've brought with me. Well, um, obviously there are, but um, I hadn't been a project manager before. But um, so it's yeah, I've come from a different different angle again. But um, have loved it yeah and i think that user engagement is that you know there's an endless list you could produce for each project and it's really important at planning stage to get that list right and also make sure you haven't got a lot of duplication and a lot of, a lot of passengers but we're going to come on to that as a separate exercise so i will reshare my screen again because i'm conscious we've got quite a lot to get through 
before you're all released back into the wild. Um, and I will get it back on. Let me just flick through. So we've covered your mini audit. Um, once you've worked out where you're fundable and who else you might want to be working with, you have to look at specific schemes and work out what they want to fund. That should be really straightforward, but it may not be. That there may be complex schemes. The schemes change all the time. And that's why someone like Emmy is going to be your best friend. Um, and there may be lots of different sources of this information. And there might be some complexities to it as well. So as well as looking at the funding scheme web page, you might look at the wider website to see what their mission statement is. There may be a more information section. There will probably be a big wadge of scheme guidance for applicants that the applicants very rarely read themselves, but Emmy and I do. Uh, webinars, really useful um, because you'll find the things that aren't in the criteria. And it might be a couple of hours of your time, several months before the deadline, but I would always urge you to participate in those. And then there may be broader strategic priority documents that show how your project might align. So that's a lot of reading to do. And you may not know where to go. So again, um, asking experienced applicants or professional support people where you look and what to look for. Um, and if they're really good, they may even summarize it for you. Um, it's super useful. Um, but within that, um, you can find some quite misleading criteria. Um, and the UKRI, uh, which is an, a you know, complex agency with lots of political pressure on it, um, and you slightly get the impression that perhaps schemes were organised by committees with lots of different competing voices and lots of writing and overwriting of the criteria, uh, mean that you can run into shoals by taking the criteria literally. So I've made myself a little personal list, which I'm sharing with you now, and it's being recorded, of phrases I look out for when I'm reading scheme criteria. So, for instance, we welcome or we encourage sometimes means we have to allow this, but we don't particularly encourage it. If something is described as an exception, it means as an exception. Or if it says you, if it's very conditional, just have a think and get some advice. Um, and also any eligible cost that actually can't be easily incorporated or justified um, into your budget uh, might make you think again as whether that should be an important part of your design. And I've actually come up with an example. Um, you won't be able to particularly read this, um, but there is a link if you're interested. And it's the Future Leader Fellowship, a very important flagship UKRI scheme um, that is generally intended for people to spend 100% of their time on a particular project over four to seven years. But this is the UKRI. You know, there are AEDI um, expectations as well. What if people have childcare? So there is a part-time option. And recently, um, they came up with the idea of a job share option as well. Uh, but when you read this guidance, the, the circumstances in which a job share would be viable for this scheme are very specific and very conditional. Um, you know, it has you have to show that um, this could not be achieved by a part time fellowship um, and that you know, perhaps you're working together already and doing exactly the same thing. So very few of the job share candidates will be eligible for this. And they're all invited to discuss it with the UKRI in advance. So this would be an example where you might see for future leader fellowships that job share is an option. That doesn't mean you should leap on it um, and assume that that's welcomed. It might be a sort of very complex, exceptional thing. So just something to keep in mind that don't take all the guidance at face value. There's also a set of criteria that might be completely hidden. And this may be because the funder considers it absolutely obvious. Um, uh, and if you're an early career researcher and perhaps working in a small group or a small institution, you might not appreciate that. So 
the fact that you need a PhD is so blindingly obvious to most funding agencies, they may not state it in the guidance. Um, also, you can't already know the answer to your question. That's something the humanities researchers often get wrong. They sort of written their book and they just want the time to write it. But this is a process of inquiry, a research project. So it's not sort of, you can't retrofit the design. The project needs to be coherent and logical just because someone's, you know, but just because it's a curiosity driven scheme doesn't mean you can propose exactly what you want and it will get funded. And actually your project nearly always needs to be of interest outside your specific discipline, unlike um, you know, something that goes to a very specific publication. And I've got an example of a hidden criteria, and this is from the EPSRC, and it's the eligibility of individuals. I had to Google this to find it. It's very hard to navigate to it um, from the website itself. And actually what it says here is that you must be an academic employee. You must already have a job. This is not the case with all the research councils. So it's not the case with the ESRC. So if you are looking at a, repurposing a project from the ESRC to the EPSRC, um, and there might be situations in which that's possible, actually the basic eligibility is really different. Um, and you have to know that before you start. And it's really easy to make those assumptions. I mean, it's, as uh, Emma said in her presentation, it varies and it changes the different criteria. Um, so you have to be really sure of that um, before you get going. I mean, I have worked on applications where two weeks before submission, um, the applicant has realized that actually what they wanted to do is not entirely eligible and had to withdraw their application. That's really heartbreaking for them because they've worked so hard on it and they have so many competing demands on their time. So, you need to navigate yourself your way through an enormous web of guidance um, with the unwritten criteria, the hidden criteria and the misleading criteria. Um, these are very competitive schemes. You can't reapply. So you need to give your project the best possible shot of getting funded. Um, one thing I'd always do is look at what the agency has funded previously, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, I'd also look at the guidance for the actual reviewers, the people who have been making the decisions. These are often published. So you have a look at that and you can see how your submitted application is actually going to be reviewed. Um, I also take a look at the membership of the assessment panel, the panel chair. Often again, that's published. Um, and just understand the review and selection process itself. What um, qualities does the application document you submit need to have to survive that process? And I take the advice and, inf and get informal review. Um, so at idea stage, let's find one who's someone who sits on the panel who knows what sorts of projects fly. Let's speak to someone who's worked on this scheme extensively either from professional services or you know as a researcher themselves so these are really important preliminary stages um and here's how some of it might work so emmy's mentioned this already it's the um ukri's gateway to research it's my absolute go-to to see what sort of projects they funded before but other agencies have similar things like welcome's got a good search term you know search engine um, and so has um, the european research council i spend a lot of time when i start working on a bid looking at these um i wasn't quite confident to do a live search but i did one yesterday i put it ai chronic health as a search term just to see what comes up there's masses and you can also look at date ranges, uh, different research councils, um, different levels of funding. Um, but sometimes a really broad one's a really good starting point because you can actually, I see there, um, you know, the MRC and ESRC are featuring really prominently. I can see that actually a lot of this is a very, very recent award. This is not, um, uh, you know, something that was fashionable 10 years ago. Um, and then you can, if you see a project that has some parallels with yours, you can go into it, see what level was the PI, um, who are the partners on this, and really get an idea of, you know, 
whether you might have a chance, uh, whether you seem to fit the brief for this. And actually, you might find that you know some of these people or you feel confident to reach out to someone who's completed a project on there and they might even be able to advise you. So um, it's a super good starting point. And you might find someone in your own institution has done this as well. So um, I think that's a brilliant use of 15 minutes uh, while you're planning a particular project. I would also look at the assessment process for a particular scheme. So what typically will happen, uh, you submit your application and it goes to an administrator and they will check whether your project is eligible. You know, is the budget right? Have you got the right employment contract? Is the team correct? Is it the right disciplinary alignment? Um, so you certainly don't want to fall down at that hurdle, but they may also be involved in assigning reviewers. And that means that the reviewers are perhaps not always the best person um, for your scheme. So, you know, luck's already creeping in there. It then is sent to specialist review, unless it's a two stage application. I'm, I'm working on a one stage one here. Um, so perhaps three to five reviewers. And they're all going to have varying levels of expertise, enthusiasm and positivity. Um, they are asked to do a specialist assessment using a template against the evaluation criteria. How well they do that is largely out of your control. You can nominate reviewers for various schemes. They tend to be taken a little less seriously. You can also ask for certain reviewers not to be invited if you've got a really terrible history with them. Um, and again, that's something to discuss before you decide whether you do it. The reviews come in. There's usually a score against it. Um, the reviewed bids then go to the panel introducers. So the panel is going to then make the recommendations and the ranking. It's a smaller group, so they will be less specialists. There might be a broad alignment with your discipline or your topic. But really, they're not going to know perhaps a lot more than... You know, the, the, the research support staff in your department. Um, they're going to be working under pressure. They're going to be working across a whole variety of bids. Most of the applications will be pretty high quality. Perhaps half of them are going to be fundable, but they can only fund five, 10 percent of them. And also they don't want to look foolish in front of their peers at the panel. So you want to make their job as easy as possible. They will introduce your project um, and make a sort of summary and a recommendation and then the panel members will help decide and vote they're pretty non-specialists they're fellow academics they've got a large number of bids to process possibly they haven't even read your application and certainly haven't read it fully they might have scanned the budget the abstract and the title um, but they want your bid to help them ask intelligent questions because they don't want to look foolish either and help rank all the bids under consideration. So your application needs to survive that process. Um, and that's gonna be really important to the writing process. Um, and here's something I dragged out. Again, it's very small type, but you can have a look at it through the link and the slides will be available uh, later. Not every funding agency make these available, but this is an example of an EPSRC one. And it looks at what you, the reviewer is asked to comment on for the new investigator scheme. So there'll be quality, importance, your ability to deliver, that's the, um, you know, the project management, whether you've achieved sufficient research independence, whether the resources and management are good enough, and whether the host organisation is supporting you. So not all of these will be top of your mind when you're designing your project, but you will be assessed on all of them. And you don't want to fall down on these smaller things because the competition's so tough, you need to make sure that you tick every box in your final application. And then you are given a score at the end. Um, and as anyone who's worked on UKRI bids, those scores really need to be in the five and sixes. You, know, you might get funded without a six, but you'd have to be really lucky. And you know, even ones with predominantly sixes don't always get scored. But actually, you know, a four is not a bad assessment. A good proposal that meets assessment criteria, but with minor weaknesses. I mean, that sounds fair enough, doesn't it? A four has no hope of, of getting funded um, unless you can show that the reviewer is um, 
being in some way malicious or incompetent. And that's a very uh, that's a very dark art indeed. So that's a great reality check before you start is what the review template looks like. So I think it's really important to emphasize the role of luck and the implications of this. Your peer review may not be you know, what you would hope. You can't predict who else will be applying to the same competition or what biases the panel members have. The process is ultimately subjective. You know, we all like different sorts of research and different methods. And if there's one brilliant, and very expensive project in the same round, it might confer, you know, consume a huge amount of funds. So luck always plays a part. Excellent projects do get rejected. Um, as Emma said, that has to become part of uh, your capacity of a as a research is to take that rejection and move on and learn how to repurpose your project. Um, Emmy's recommendation that you have a five-year plan so you're never just dependent on one application, and that you haven't piled all your hope into that one application um, is really important. So you have a sustainable research career um, and you keep your resilience levels high. Um, so um, before we move on to planning, um, the individual bid, developing a fundable mindset is super important. Um, and this is, you know, if you were to cut out and keep one or two of the slides from this presentation, this is a good one just to stick on your pin board. You know, funding bids, they're a research input, not a research output. Though. This is a technical document. It's a sales and marketing exercise. It's not a beautiful piece of stylish dissemination. You might have a great idea and it may not fit any available funding scheme. And you might have to come up with another idea and grants are huge speculative investments made under pressure, made in competition. Um, so every aspect of it is going to be scrutinized extremely carefully. Um, so you know, a good funding bid will recognize and reflect all these issues. How do you manage and how do we actually manage in helping academics create fundable bids amongst all this noise and different information that's coming in at us. Um, in writing my book four years ago, I came up with, with my co-author four underlying criteria that every single funding agency wants, although they're all defined differently. Um, and that's the bit of the book that I remember and use. Um, but every funding agency wants important and relevant questions defined differently. They all want evidence of a high chance of successful delivery. They all want to think that the research team behind the project is competent and they all want to make an excellent value investment. Every sentence of your funding proposal needs to evidence one of those four things. And to help your assessors do their job when they're not expert and when they're working under pressure and they have to make these very competitive decisions, your proposal needs to be three things. It needs to be really convincing and supported with evidence. It has to be really quick to read and it has to be really easy to understand. Now, obviously, if uh, you know, it's a highly technical STEM discipline, I would not expect to understand the methodology, but I would expect to understand the introduction, the logic of it, the summary, and all the other documents around it. And if it's a social science application, I would expect to be able to understand every single word of it. So this is possibly another little cutter and keep um, element. And when we get to the writing session, um, we've got 15 minutes, so I'm just gonna cover a few more slides before that. Um, you know, these are the things we'll be keeping in mind. So the second part of your process is planning the individual application. You've done all that groundwork. You've decided that a particular scheme, whether it's ARIA, whether it's the European Research Council, whether it's the Wellcome Trust is the one that's right for you. You are now going to plan an individual application and you're going to get in touch with your equivalent of any as soon as possible to start that process. Uh, so how do you ensure that your application has the best chance of being funded? 
because most applications that go in are going to be eligible. Success rates may be as low as 10% or even lower. Um, and you may have put in a lot of application. You might find they sort of get through to the panel. They get through to stage two. They are, they're in the ballpark, but they're not getting funded. And they might be worthy of funding, but they get consistently rejected. So our job as research support people is just to get you that incremental difference that might make the difference between your excellent project getting funded or not. Here's what you need to think of. You can have a funding strategy. Emmy's actually covered that with far more detail, so I don't think you need to dwell on this. Um, but you need this range of different project ideas for different funders. And then you need to look at the funding wheel. When's the deadline? How far in advance are you going to have to start working? Um, have you got responsibilities elsewhere that might mean you have to you know, spend a longer period? Um, what are the efficiencies of scale and effort? you can make to make sure you do not lose your life in making this application that may well get rejected? And how can you take a long term view of the process? And this is what the next uh, 10 minutes or so are going to cover. So every proposal has the same six components. They all articulate a question. There's always a team or an investigator. They have a method section. There's information about feasibility, risk and management. There's your outcomes and your outputs and your budget. These are the things you're going to have to pull together in the time period before submission. I'm going to say that's going to take you at least six weeks. If you're an early career researcher working on a complex bit, it might take you six months. For something like the European Research Council, I'm glad to see Emmy's nodding there. <laughs> For uh, future leader fellowships, you know, these are very predictable schemes that start working six months to a year in advance so you can really plan this project. Um, I'm mapping this onto a typical UKRI application because most of you will engage with the UKRI at some stage. An application template really vary. You know, this is very different from an ARIA application, from European Research Council, from Leverhulme. Um, so I'm using this as an example, but the principles apply to any other funding agency. So um, UKRI, it's about six pages, uh, the proposal, 3000 word count. This can vary. Um, you always need to check. That's not a lot, but, you know, perhaps a project that's going to be a million pounds or more. There'll always be a summary or an abstract. Um, there will be a vision section, which is, you know, what you want to do. There'll be an approach section where you explain how are you going to do it? There will be a capability to deliver where you explain your track record. We've got another session that focuses on that um, in a few weeks time. Um, so I won't dwell on that too much. And then there will be your budget and your justification of resources. There will also be a, you know, a set of bureaucratic sections um, that you might have to upload separately. Um, and you need to know they're coming because you need make, to make time to do them properly. Um, EDI action plans are increasingly common, increasingly important. I'm working on a doctoral training bid at the moment where actually the EDI action plan has more word count than the approach section than the proposal itself. And we're spending a lot of time focusing on that. Um, so, you know, you need to scope your application at an early stage because these sections could all be deal breakers. You get them wrong. You know, however inspiring your ideas are, however innovative your methodology, if you don't tick these other boxes, uh, you're not likely to get funded. And then there's some really boring, but very important uh, things like the word count and the page length, the line spacing, the font and the type size. You, you use the wrong font and suddenly you convert it and you've got half a page to cut off and it's a day before submission. Um, margin size, really important for you, it was always important for you, KRI, and whether you can include references or not, and whether they're in the word count or not, you need to know before you start writing, not, um, you know, not just as you finish the draft. So I've done a really, um, a really vague timeline to submission here. Um, actually, Emmy and I have worked on projects together, we might do a much more complex, customised timeline depending on the scheme, depending on your other commitments, depending on when people are going on leave. It's really useful to have that because you can set yourself a series of internal deadlines and you also do things in the right order. So you started by reading the criteria 
and working out what it is the funder wants to invest in. You're then going to design your project. And then I put in bold, scope the budget. You don't know what exchange rates are, what the overheads might be. It's really easy to think I've got two and a half million pounds to pay lay with and then realize half of that has gone in overheads and indirect costs. And actually, you haven't thought that your um, your postdocs, you know, you need to add the on costs on the London waiting on. And it can easily just fizzle out um, and you have to redesign your project halfway through writing it. Um, I would then always suggest scoping your overall argument and structure the proposal. So, you know, what sort of word count you've got for each section. This is a very technical process. It's not a beautiful piece of creative writing. Now, obviously, you all have your own writing and thinking styles, but that's something that works for a number of applicants. Um, I then, then think it, it's quite useful to work out what evidence you want to marshal under each of these subheadings. Uh, you create a full draft. You might not start at the beginning. Um, something I find working with uh, researchers in the humanities and the social sciences, they love a literature review. And it's very easy for five of the six pages to be devoted in a really beautiful, elegant literature review that we then have to cut down to one and a half page at a later stage. Um, at the end of the process, you write the first line, the abstract and finalise the title. And if you've got letters of support and commitment, uh, make sure you've got the right title in there. Um, so the title is really important. Um, and leave lots of time for feedback and multiple drafts. Um, on a complex application, even with an experienced applicant, I've got to version 15 before submission. So, um, you know, you'll need at least three and probably four or five. So this is all super important stuff. Um, and if you can get this in your diary, uh, you will um, also not feel you're going slightly mad in the three days before submission. You know, if you've got a deadline on Tuesday, you do not want to be trying to get hold of people on Sunday to um, sort out your budget. That is the end of uh, part two. I know we've got a break now, so I will stop sharing. Um, I'm really conscious that um, I'm putting 20 years worth of experience in one sort of hour, hour and a half presentation. The best way of learning this stuff is actually to work live on applications and you will develop your own style and your own strategies as you go. Um, you know, it's very hard to keep all of this in mind. Um, but I think it will give you a sort of, you know, just a bit of a mindset of understanding that you can't sort of crash into the process with too many assumptions. So I'm glad you've had a break first, though, because the third part is writing the proposal, which is a whole, you know, different ball game again. Um, and this is much more technical. You know, what actual techniques do you need to use in writing a grant application as opposed to your PhD thesis or you know your teaching material or um, writing for publication for a specialist journal. So there's the five things you need to keep in mind you, as you write. Your assessors are very busy. They're not particularly expert. They know it may not be really enthusiastic. They may be reviewing applications as a bit of a chore. They need to do their bit for the discipline. They may be sitting on a train thinking, oh, I've got you know 45 minutes free. Let's have a look. Um, and they don't want you to make it difficult for them. Uh, they don't want to look, hunt through the proposal to find the evidence that supports your claims. There's no point in you saying, you know, this is an amazing team without providing some evidence for why you're an amazing team. Um, and there's a phrase that Emmy used earlier, uh, seeing the wood for the trees. Um, it, <laughs> it's really, really easy to get so bogged down with everything you have to do that you end up with a sort of word soup of writing and overwriting in your proposal. I'm working one at the moment that's going in on Tuesday. At the moment, it is word soup. And my job this evening is to edit it and get an authorial voice back into it. Um, you know, remember the four underlying cr criteria of importance, success, competence and value. Otherwise, you can end up in a sort of complete tangle of incomprehensible prose. You can't do it alone. You, know, you need some professional support and you need some academic support as well. You need a fresh pair of eyes to look at it at some point. Um, you will not be able to see the wood for the trees. And 
rejection of good projects is absolutely inevitable. You have to keep on applying. Um, I remember going to a grant writing talk by a very senior academic at the University of Kent who had run multiple um, awards um, over a decade long career. And he came into the room and he rolled up his jacket and held it in his arms and said, um, you know, writing a grant application is like taking your baby to a baby show and showing your baby to people. Uh, expecting them to say how beautiful your baby is and they say that your baby is ugly and it really really hurts um, and I thought that was a very nice analogy um, for the process of rejection he also had an enormous pile of papers which was his rejected grant applications back in the day when they were paper-based um, you know we all hear about each other's successes we do not hear about each other's rejections so you are in very good company that was really great that Emma um, owned up to the rejections she's had uh, that underpin the very considerable success as well. So do always keep this in mind and be kind to yourself as you write your first grant. So your assessors are going to be writing, you know, focusing on different parts of the bid. So there'll be a different writing style for each of them. So the reviewers, everyone, well, actually everyone's going to look at the title and abstract. That's what they'll go to. They just need to get their head around what's going on. Um, they will look at the budget to see how much you're asking for. They will look at the team members. Is it you know one person? Is it 26 people? Who are they? Have they heard of them? The reviewers will focus more on the approach section, the what you're going to do, the methodology, if it's UKRI. The panel members will probably flick through approach and look more at vision. Um, the reviewers will look at the other sections as needed for further detail about things like ethics, justification of resources. Um, and within the panel, the wider panel members may just look at your abstract, your first lines, your headings, the team and the budget. They will not be focusing hard on it. So, you know, certain parts of the application have to jump out of the page. So looking at the vision, which um, you know, I've taken the EPSRC as a model here. Um, that's the sort of introduction to your proposal. Um, you know, it might be called state of the art if it was European Research Council. There's different phrases, but they all do the same sort of thing. Um, and actually vision varies between the different research councils as well. So you can't assume it's exactly the same. So these are what you need to cover off uh, according to the criteria in an EPSRC vision statement. Um, and it's quite turgid, isn't it? It's actually quite hard to work out how are you going to translate that into perhaps 500 words of really punchy prose. Um, and I'll come on to that in a minute because it's going to have to be easy to understand. It's going to have to be quick to read. It has to be really convincing. What are the things you say? to achieve that? How, and how do you interpret that criteria? Because um, there's a lot to do here. Um, and I always quite like to sort of take a close, slightly sceptical look at that. So I've picked out a few bits and pieces here. So vision clearly links to the underlying criterion of importance. Importance is actually in there. And I notice looking at that, that twice it says beyond the fields or areas. They're obviously very keen you write beyond your discipline in this section. They're also looking down to the bottom, very keen to make sure that you are identifying the possible beneficiaries. And they've worked hard on that phrase, doesn't it? Because it's a potential, direct or indirect benefits and beneficiaries. There's a lot of anxiety and effort around that. So you're going to have to tick that box. Um, and again, with impact, you know, it's quite a sort of convoluted um, phrase that's used. So, you know, you have to jump through those ho hoops, even if you're proposing a completely piece of blue sky research. And I don't think that's probably the case with most of you. You probably all have clear applications, but you have to be able to show that link in the vision. So, you know, with my first draft, I would always go back to, you know, these five points and say, is it achieving what they want? Am I going to be providing enough information for the assessors to do their job? And that's something you see actually in reviews that this looks like a really interesting project, but they didn't provide enough information for me to be able to review it. More of an issue in approach, but it applies across the whole application. Um, you then 
move on to approach. Um, and this is a longer section, uh, you know, perhaps I, I'm working on one at the moment that's three and a half thousand words for a big center application, but it may be much less than that. The other one I'm working on at the moment is only a thousand words. Um, there's a lot to pack in there. So this is more about how you are going to deliver it. And, you know, the language all drives that home. You know, feasibility, is it effective? Uh, clarity. I think, you know, clear and transparent methodology, really important here. Um, this is where you provide a blueprint of actually what you're going to do. You know, in many ways, a step-by-step -step account that if you were taken out of the picture, could someone follow this and run the same project? It's not really a the space for being too confidential about what you want to do. You have to you know, trust the process to an extent. You know, how are you going to use the knowledge as well? And how will your research environment um, you know, help this? And actually, you know, the further you, you go into STEM subjects, the more important that is. Um, you know, and when we were looking at the fundability audit, actually, if you have access to particular resources and particular facilities through your employer, that makes you a much more attractive um, member of a team. So the approach is not going to feel like a great bit of creative writing. It has to pack all the information in and all the evidence. So again, just looking at the approach section in terms of the underlying criteria, this one maps onto success primarily. You know, is it going to be effective? Is it going to be feasible? The word success is actually used down the bottom. And, you know, again, there's this sort of outputs, outcomes, impacts. This is really important to UKRI. Um, and they're looking at using as much different terminology as possible to try and um, get this message across to you. Um, so, you know, really take a moment to think about what they want. And that's why it's a really good idea to think I've got X thousand words to work with. I have to cover off all these uh, different headings. What does that mean in terms of what sort of word count I might need for each of these? Um, and then, you know, construct it from the inside out rather than starting from the beginning. Something you are allowed to do um within both of these sections is use visuals um, and they don't add to your word count however um i think reviewers can find a really sort of complicated process diagram very irritating and just sort of just sort of skip over it so the the, the guidance is is quite clear and says you know if absolutely necessary you can do it if it's something that can't be explained in words it is an option for you but i would be quite um judicious in your use of diagrams you'll definitely need a gantt chart in there somewhere and that can be pretty simple you can do that in excel and people like emmy and i do these all the time for our applicants uh but again you'll need a reality check to make sure that this is understandable to the person um reading the application so i've covered importance which maps onto vision and success which maps on maps onto approach what about the other two criteria competence this is about you um there are a number of ways you show your competence across the application there will be the dedicated capability to deliver section we've got a separate workshop about that because there's this new thing called the resume for research and innovation um, it's a narrative CV. They are getting increasingly fashionable. The Royal Society uses them. The European Research Council also uses them in part. Um, and UKRI has done away completely with CVs for the time being. And the entire team um, is represented in one quite short, perhaps about a thousand words, um, uh, document that explains their capability. We'll be looking at that separately. But even the team composition evidences your competence, as we found out in the um, in in the you know audit we did in the first part of this presentation. You need to make sure that everyone contributes something very distinctive, that there is an overlap, and that there aren't passengers as well. So it's something that happens quite early on in proposals. Often that uh, you know, people want to be kind to their friends or supportive to their colleagues 
um, they bring them on board to a project uh, when they haven't got a lot to contribute. So this is a really brutal exercise. You need to be really careful about that. There's no point having four people with exactly the same experience because they feel comfortable working together. Um, you might be better off going it alone or working with people from different institutions. You also evidence competence through your choice of scheme, um, how well you present your proposal, um, and also then how you write the proposal, you know, how you justify your methods. And of course, there's self-citation. Um, you need to show that you have experience with the methods, with the participant uh, populations you use, with the equipment you use. Um, and you do that as well as through the CV, but through self-citation in the proposal. This is incredibly important. Something to check that everyone on the team should probably be cited somewhere in the proposal. Um, and that, so that is more diffuse across the application. Value is also evidence across the application. It's concentrated on the budget and justification. Um, and it's very much a comparative judgment. Uh, you might have a project about a particular health condition that goes to a curiosity driven scheme. You might be up against something that uses completely different methods to look at a completely different topic. How is one more important than the other? And the pricing will be part of that. You know, a project that costs four million will have higher standards applied to it than one that costs uh, half a million, but it's still feasible. Um, your reviewers will be also looking for unnecessary elements in your, um, in your budget. So conferences in the Seychelles, uh, lots of iPads that can't quite link to those to how the data will be collected and also whether your methods themselves are economical if you're using something interview based do you really need to fly across the world to conduct those interviews or could it be done by zoom or do you need to create an entire data set or is there a secondary data set that you could use um so where you do have to have an expensive method of uh, data collection you need to have evidence shot through the entire proposal to why this is the most economical way of doing it. It's not the overall price that's the issue. Um, it's It really is a question of value. So you have to, across this application, convince your assessors of all these points. Um, I won't go through all these questions individually, but I've put a sort of few questions about how you translate the assessment criteria into a series of sentences. So vision, you have to evidence quality and importance. So the questions you might ask yourself is why do we need to know the answer to this question? You know, either within a discipline or within society more broadly. Um, something I always ask applicants is, why has the question not been asked before? Because it could just be because it's not a very interesting or important question. Or why hasn't it been answered properly? You know, there's different things that make a project important. And if you can make a statement about that, perhaps because it's been looked at in particular silos or using you know, an out of date analytical tool and there's something new that's come in that can do it sort of more quickly or precisely you know what is the skill set of your team that makes it you're uniquely placed to answer this question and why is your approach of the highest quality you know, why will it do more than the established approaches or the previous approaches in terms of knowledge what is it that we don't know and why do we need to know it uh as well as the findings, what about the methods? How will they contribute to the field? And how will someone outside your discipline find them interesting or even outside academia? So a phrase that I rage against is the gap in the literature. Emmy's really familiar with that one. To say that there is a gap in the literature is no evidence of originality or any contribution, any meaningful contribution. You'll have to make a case for you know, the impact and timeliness of your research. So, you know, like why is now the best time to, to conduct this research? And of course, now means 18 months time usually, because it's going to take a year to get the decision and then six months 
to get the answer. So you know that could be a problem with some COVID related projects, you know, or Brexit related. You know, we have these sort of fashions that everyone's focusing on the same issue or terrorism around 9-11. Um, but in three or four years time, that's going to fade and something else will come in. So you, you know, it needs to have some durability in terms of timeliness. And ultimately, what in is there out there in the world that your project will ultimately change? And even the most basic science, you can make that potential link. You know, to go back to the um, vision criteria for UKRI, what are the potential direct or indirect beneficiaries? You need to be able to make some sort of link. Sorry, I wanted to, didn't want to move on yet. And then the beneficiaries. You know, who within the discipline and beyond the discipline can really help, you know, would really benefit from this. You know, if you've got a project that involves users um, and they're engaged or a part of an advisory group, that's really helpful to show that potential link. Um, so you're going to be in sort of jigsaw puzzle mode here, trying to get together within that 500 words, how all these different arguments stitch together and make a narrative. Approach is a bit longer and you've even got you've got more to, to fit in here. So, again, there's a series of headings. Um, the context, the literature review. Uh, this has to be quite brief. It's really easy to, you know, go into overdrive about this, but there's a lot to cover off. Um, a justification for your design. Sorry, I keep trying to... Um, move bits of the screen around or I keep moving on. Um, so designing methods. You work within a very specific field. You all understand each other's methods um, and why your sort of design is the best way of answering a question. Your assessors may disagree. You know, it may be if you go for um, a funding agency such as the Levy Hume or the European Research Council, depending on which panels you go to, you may be up against people who use qualitative methods or your assessors may have you know, a completely different view of the best way of answering the question. So you need to write defensively about why your choices are appropriate, looking at the limitations of previous approaches. Um, your methodological choice is a very active one. It's not an assumption. And your assessors may not even know about your methods. You may need to provide a sort of introductory couple of lines and some references as about why they're the best way of answering the question. And then you need to give a very detailed description of the research process itself. It's not a sketch, it's a blueprint. So stuff that might seem very obvious to you, it's like, how many data points will there be? Um, you know, how long will this take? You know. How much can a postdoc get through in a day? You know, how long does it take to process particular pieces of information? How much equipment do you need to do this? Um, all of this may need to be spelt out. So the assessor can really visualize why your project will take three postdocs, three years to come up with the appropriate answers. Um, again, you need to expand on the outcomes outputs and impacts in the approach section. You know, what will the project tell us? How will it change things? And then how will you let people know about your findings? Here you need to ambition, you know, balance ambition with realism. Um, if you think you can get a nature paper out of this, say it. Um, if it's an unrealistic ambition, it's not going to go down so as well. So you're better to be sort of realistically ambitious than really going into overdrive. Also think about non-academic stakeholders. How will they find about, out about your project? Obviously, there will probably be open access to the um, findings, but perhaps a clinician would not be able to easily access something that's highly technical. Um, so you might need to think about non-executive summaries, going to the right sorts of conferences, creating user reports. Um, and part of the competence story is whether your team are competent to translate your findings. Are you used to working with a particular user group? I mean, all of that needs to be crammed in. So probably your first draft of approach 
is going to be way over the word count. And then we will help bring it back down and prune out all the adjectives um, and all the things that um, are not strictly necessary. So don't worry too much about word count in your first draft, just try and get everything in there. Um, you will also have to have an active case about feasibility with timings, the Gantt chart, um, the work plan, saying who will carry out which part of the project. So if you're asking for three uh, postdocs, you know, link them to a particular work program. So again, me as a reviewer, I can think, oh yeah, I can see postdoc one is spending one year on this, postdoc two is spending three years on that part. And it's a very clear map of where the resources fit. And again, you know, your environment. As you saw on the EPSRC review template I put up earlier, um, environment may be an active part of the review. So, you know, if you have particular equipment, particular expertise, that might be very important. You might need a separate heading about that. So that's the information you have to put in to convince your assessors. How do you actually write convincingly? A phrase that I was given by someone who chairs an ELC panel is to aim for effortless superiority. It's a particular tone of voice. You're not boastful. You're not apologetic. Um, you're not relying on lots of hyperbole. It's just a very clear, relaxed argument that takes the assessor through the project. You know, you finish reading it and you have no doubt this person, this team of people can deliver this job. Um, you don't parrot back the criteria to assessors and put them in bold. You know, you say this is significant and timely because you weave them in with subtlety. Um, and there's a whole list of words that I hate seeing, like gap in the literature in, in grant applications, innovative, groundbreaking, esteemed, world leading. It's not necessary. You show, you don't tell. It can feel quite difficult not to include them, but really it does add to the word soup. Uh, so actually, I would avoid adjectives and adverbs as far as possible, unless they're strictly informative. Um, again, they make it quite difficult to read and they look effortful. Uh, and your aim is, that, you know, if you can submit a well-argued funding proposal, it really helps make the case that you can also manage a million pound plus grant. If you can't submit something that's not full of typos, that doesn't get the margins right. It doesn't give enormous confidence to the people making the assessment. But also equally, it's not a new business pitch. You're not working for an advertising agency. You're not writing those press releases I used to write back in the 1990s. It doesn't need to be glossy. It doesn't need to have amazing diagrams. It's a functional technical document that gives the assessors enormous confidence in what you're doing. So, I've just got three more slides before we get to another practical exercise. And this is looking at how you might write something that's easy to understand. I would start by immediately telling the panel members in the first line of the project what it does. Don't start with a quote from Plato or Donald Trump or you know, whoever's the most quoted person at the moment. Don't start with an anecdote. You, know, you don't need teaser information. You know, quite, it's quite acceptable that this project investigates and will tell us. Um, use very consistent terminology. It's not a place of elegant variation, stylish writing. So your objectives, your research questions, your work program headings would all use the same phrase and terms. Um, you're going to avoid non, you know, subdisciplinary jargon, and that's really hard because this is the jargon, you know, this is the language you use every day. Um, this is why non-specialist review is, is really important. Um, background information, short examples for non-specialists. You know, if you're explaining some particular process or condition, explain what the impact will be in four or five words. And also aim for a very logical layout. You know, you might start with your project aim, 
your objectives that meet the aim, the research questions that map onto the objectives, then onto the research design, then to your work program, and then to your outputs. You build your argument so that every section primes the following section. We could literally do another two hour session on just that. Um, and that's where working with someone like Emmy will really help you as you, as you work on your drafts and refine them. Um, acronyms, another of my bugbears, only use them if they're really, really recognizable. I've given some examples, you know, you don't need a definition for those. If it's, you know, a very long uh, technical term that is also not recognized, then you can introduce the acronym and use it, but um, don't invent an acronym for a funding proposal and just include enough detail for the, the more specialist reviewers, you know, and then they will understand from the six page document what you intend to do that is worth a three million pound investment. Um, this is really key. It's actually, I'd say, more, more important than being quick to read. You know, it has to be understandable. But being quick to read is a bit of the icing on the cake. This is where we can help in the, you know, the days, weeks before submission to do help you with a bit of a copy edit. Sentences should be short, paragraphs should be short. I'm always switching verbs into the present tense and into the active tense, you know, not sort of, um, you know, long conditional looping, you know, looping arguments that are, you know, it's very easy to, to rely on those. Um, sentences with lots of clauses, sub clauses, exceptions and nuanced statements. I think, you know, if you're working in, in the STEM area, you're probably less likely to do that than researchers than the humanities and the social sciences, but it can still creep in. Actually, big, dense blocks of test, text, line breaks, headings, lists, bullet points. Um, thinking, you know, I've got six pages. How many words do I get? And that is a very, very false economy. Actually, headings and numbering. So people can move backwards and forwards. They're going to be reading this on a train. They're going to be flicking through on their screen or on a printout. Um, they need to be able to go backwards and forwards quickly. Um, and also just look at, you know, I always think using lots of bold in the middle of sentences isn't particularly helpful because your eye just jumps about. Um, you know, go back and read what you've, you've read, get someone else to read it just to see, you know, can they get through this really quickly with interest? And now um, we have um, the chance for you to put some of this into practice um, with an abstract exercise. So on HackMD is a link to a bad abstract. There's also a, ga a good abstract on there. Um, and we're gonna trust you not to look at the good abstract, but um, Emma, I think you, are you putting people into groups for this? Yeah, I'm going to try and pair people up. OK. Um, and then they can they can have a chat. I think it would be better to have a chat about yeah. it. And I'm going mean, to I'm going to paste the link. Um, there's a Google Doc, um, which hopefully you can all access here. Um, that's the hopefully I've given you the <laughs> I'm going to click on it, make sure I've given you the bad version and not the good version. Yep. So this is the this is the bad version because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> there is a good slightly better I wouldn't say it's the excellent version it's slightly better oh no um, it's, a, it's a very workable version the uh the good one yeah so this is a project that I've actually I've actually done we didn't actually have to apply for funding because it actually was directly funded it was a covid project so it was actually directly funded through the government actually in the end um but I was imagining this like applying what I would write if I had applied for funding for this project because it is a very technical project as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. please go in and copy. I can see people are already copying this text. So copy it into a document, share that maybe with the person in your in your room, and I'll set the breakout rooms up now. Yeah, How so long do you think we'll have um, for that? I don't know what, you know, do you think 15 minutes, 10 minutes? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, you're not expected to write a sort of a whole new abstract. It's more of a critiquing exercise. So I've yeah. put you know, a, a list of bullet points of the sorts of thing an abstract needs to do. Just have a look at it and see whether it 
does that and you know what you might recommend to to improve it so actually you know the, these practical exercises um are how you learn um and also the abstract is something that everyone will read everyone assessing the application will read it's absolutely key to set your reviewers setting your reviewers off on the right track hopefully you had fun uh, ripping apart this awful um, abstract <laughs> that I wrote for you. So I'm going to share my screen and then so you can see it. And then um, Jacqueline will take you through. But I think we probably want to hear, well, I'll leave Jacqueline to it. I'll just yeah. share my screen and then. Um, there we go. There we go. And you've all got copies in front of you. I mean, what's wrong with it? Any... Uh... I don't know, do you want to just sort of pipe up or put things in the chat? Hmm. Uh, we've got difficult to read and understand exactly what they're wanting to do. Absolutely. What makes it difficult to read? Yeah. <laughs> Too many words associated with a single concept. Exactly. And would you all be able to think of how you might qualify that technical jargon? Yeah, it's a, it's a great big old block of text, isn't it? Now they're coming. See no numbers as well. No numbers or highlights in there. <laughs> Is there anything missing? Yeah, because I mean I know nothing about this area, so I got the impression that by like coughing into your phone or something you could yeah you could you know from this version you get people to cough into a phone and that might be able to tell whether they had covid or not is that like cheap or something is that the idea it would be cheap and quick and effective cheap and quick yeah cheap and yes quick it, and it doesn't say that it doesn't yeah. say that does it I don't think Could so, it? no. It says accurate and generalisable detection. Yes. Which is so not... Oh, it does say affordable. In... It does say non-invasive, yeah. affordable, scalable. So... But I might... But cheap's even better, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so instead yeah. of driving out to the airport to have a PCR test, I could have just coughed into my... That sounds brilliant. Yeah. The idea of it is really great. I will yeah. say that this project is now published. It didn't actually work. <laughs> So just to tell everyone that this method is doesn't work or this this uh this thing but but, but yeah. there would be um some funders where that sort of risk would be you know it's worth a punt if there's enough evidence so we've also got how would it help with differential diagnosis yeah so would it just does that mean would it just show that someone was ill but it wouldn't you know, distinguish between COVID and bronchitis, or could it? Well, we don't, yeah, we don't know from this, from this abstract that it doesn't yes. say, um, it, yeah, this is what it's written as is specifically just COVID, COVID or not COVID, like mm -hmm. a binary decision mm -hmm. kind of thing, diagnosis. I am. Um... Oh. Yeah, I have to say, I love the objective, collect a large data set. It doesn't matter what the data is or what it's used for, I will collect a data set. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. process, you often get objectives um, expressed in terms of process like this. And actually an objective is what you're going to achieve. You know, what what is the data set for? And, and what does large mean? Is that 20 people coughing into their phones? 
or five million people coughing into their phones. And I'd also want to know how do you get all these people coughing into their phones and record it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's no there's no mention of how they're gonna make the data set, how they're gonna actually that process of it. Mm -hmm. And who's doing this research anyway? You know, how do we know they're any good? Yeah, there's no who because it just says world leading multi oh, world project. leading. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just looking at your criteria. So what, where, why, who, when, how? So we're missing quite a lot. We're missing who, missing how, yeah. all that sort of stuff. You know, how long will it take? You know, we will collect this data. Because if you can collect the data over a sort of three-week period um, and analyse it quickly, that might be worth, you know, even if it just says, no, that doesn't work. Or it might be useful for a sort of preliminary stage. Yeah. Um so it's not in plain English. Final sentence doesn't say anything. <laughs> yes. Perfect fit. Yeah. Um, it doesn't say, actually, it doesn't express importance. Obviously, COVID's important, but you know, it doesn't say we need to find quick, cheap diagnostic tools that can be used with people at home. You know, and that importance can then be um, balanced with the risk. Yeah. yeah and, and, and it doesn't say why, you know, how, you know, I think as well as this, the success in terms of will the project work, but will you actually get all these coughs online? I think, you know, using our existing participant pool yeah. of 5 million people who like coughing, Stop. I'm going to stop sharing because I'm going to find the good abstract yes. just to show us the difference now. Um, yes, also, you know, there's a good one setting where the data will be collected. A hospital, a GP surgery. I don't think I actually put that in the good, so I can tell you. <laughs> I don't think I actually put that in the, the method of We can make it even better then. We can make it even better, but I'll share the good one. Uh, let me share that. Yeah. I think that also shows, you know, the quite like that's a really good question. Where will it be collected? Actually, it's quite easy to, um, you know, miss that out, and then a reviewer picks it up. So that's why internal review is a really good process. So you know, this is effectively an internal review of your abstract. Yeah. That would help you make it better. Yeah. So yeah, I've shared the um the good abstract. And I'll just share my screen. You can see it here. So I try to take out all of the jargon and replace it with things that are slightly more, well, with non-technical words. So I have got, um, did I put cheap here? I don't think I, I don't think I used the word cheap. Um, no, I didn't. I said affordable. Maybe that's what I was thinking. No, I mean, affordable is fine. We can you know, make it cheap. But here you've got that, you know, MIT and University of Cambridge have proposed this as viable. So yeah. there's some reasonable provenance for that approach. And then I've got the actual team put in here. So I've explained yeah. who the team is. So it was an interdisciplinary team, Turing, blah, 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 and the government. Um, but yeah, I'd, and I've here I've taken uh, the other one had all these acronyms in for the types of machine learning mm -hmm. methods that we used but here mm -hmm. I put the actual words so they would mm -hmm. I know they're still quite technical but they're the actual words there is mm -hmm. if you wanted oh. to explain each of those it would take several yeah. paragraphs to explain each one so can't and really I imagine with the work within the world of that funding agent I mean I know what a Bayesian neural network is and I'm not yeah. an academic so you know there is a, a certain amount of knowledge we would Expect, but your objectives are already. You know, it's yeah. clear what you want to achieve. Yeah, yeah. The, I think I put the low cost here. Actually, I put that at mm -hmm. the end here. Um, accessible, simple method. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. The one thing I haven't put here actually is about how we collected the data, which is actually quite interesting because we actually use test the test and trace service. 
um, ah, which is already yeah. established and then we added on whoever came into the test and trace service the government system they were asked at the end of their phone call if they wanted to be contacted about our study so we directly took people who were providing evidence to the, their diagnoses to the government which was what people had to do in covid pandemic mm -hmm. and then we added on our research project onto the end of that just because we were working with yeah. with test and trace basically so it was an added thing on. so that immediately sorts out feasibility okay. it does yeah perfectly possible mm. to collect that amount of coughs yeah and we were aiming for 100,000 roughly i think we did get about 78,000 something like that mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the abstract's there to get you the money. Yeah. You know, if you don't then actually manage to achieve it, as long as it looks plausible. Yeah. And it's it's supported. Yeah, so I, that's very helpful, actually. That was a good set of feedback because it missed some, you know, it also raised some stuff that we didn't think about. Yeah. Yeah. What I find hard with the abstracts is because you want to put so much information in there and it, it, the word limit is very short. So when mm -hmm. you're writing, like this is a very technical project, like when you're writing things that are so technical, like I was saying, trying to explain the very technical words uh, in a non-technical way is usually more words than just using mm -hmm. that one word. Mm -hmm. And that's where I find mm -hmm. it quite difficult um, because you just there's some there's some things you have to either explain you kind of can't get around them and that's where I find it quite difficult with very technical projects I'm, I'm writing helping some a team write an abstract later on today and we're, you know, we're writing collectively but I've just asked them to give me the sort of five key points mm. about the project and then I'll cut and paste the relevant sentences you, do, you, you don't often need to generate anything especially new you string it together and then make sure it's in yeah, simple language. It's a uh... anyway. Shall I? We've got eight minutes left. I've just got like a couple of summary slides. Shall I? Shall right. I do yeah. that now? Yes. Please. Yes, please. We are reaching the end, and you can all see that. Yeah. So. You've written your abstract. So the final thing is, is your project now ready to submit? And I've just done a little checklist of what you might look at in the days before submission. You know, is it easy on the eye? Do you describe the research process? Actually, read it out loud to yourself. Take time to read it out loud. It's a good way of copy editing. You'll pick up on all the repetition. You'll realise when a sentence takes you out of breath five times, which might mean it is chopping up. Uh, are there some gaps in your logic? Is there a bit of information that should be in there? Go back to the evaluation criteria and the underlying criteria and say, you know, does this match up? Because actually, as you draft and draft, it can, easy, it can be easy to get away from the original criteria as you try and wrestle with all the technicalities. Um, get that non-specialist feedback in from someone who writes decent English and is just curious about the world and you get specialist feedback from fellow academics who can really engage with the method. So we'll say things like, what about differential diagnosis? So I will say, how will you collect those coughs? Someone will say, else will say, how do you label for differential diagnosis? Those are equally important. Um, so then you've got your final draft and you submit. Um, and if you've done a great job, you've probably got a 50-50 chance of getting funded. You know, you, you've taken your, your the possibility of getting funded up. And then you need to make sure that you have a way of varying this project so you can take it back to a different funding agency or going to a different, you know, to the same funding agency or, or take it on to a different funding agency. So don't waste your ideas on one shot. You go back to that five-year funding plan and you start working on your next grant immediately. So you never are faced with the savage disappointment of having nothing in hand. Um, so thank you very much uh, for listening. That was a massive brain dump. Uh, the slides will be available um, if you ever want to go back and refer to them. 
Uh, but I've done a little handy seven take home messages, cut out on keep section. If there's anything you remember from this talk, it could be these seven things. And thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jacqueline. So helpful. I love thank the you. summary. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. And oh, Jacqueline, you've got one more slide with a QR code on, I think. Oh, you? one more slide with a QR code. Yes. Yeah. There's another so, session. Yeah. So our next session is on a Wednesday next time. So in a couple of weeks time, the 10th of July, again, three hours, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this is particularly on these uh, resume for researchers or narrative CVs. So it's a particular new part of UKRI, but also other funders are also using them as well. So um, and that will be a really sort of interactive. There'll be lots of writing that you do. Um, one thing I, we would say is that you do need to bring your sort of current or any CV that you actually have of uh, a sort of traditional CV, bring that along because that will actually help you with the, with the writing of the narrative CV. So, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Thank you, Emmy, as well, um, for all your help with this. And I hope it was really, really useful.